Well, welcome to Tea with Mertice, Artistically Speaking, which is a series of conversations with artists featured in the Women Heal Through Rite and Ritual exhibition. Today's guest is Elsa Munoz, whose work is driven by healing techniques found in Mexican folk medicine and her intuitive process, which involves dream work and storytelling. Elsa, thank you for joining me today for Tea Time. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So I've begun each one of these conversations with the question uh, that asks the artist how the virus, the coronavirus, has impacted or if or has it impacted their artistic process? Sure. Um, so first of all, I guess I've been pretty lucky to have a studio that's in my apartment. So in that sense, it hasn't impacted me you know, just geographically speaking, I don't need to go anywhere to do my work. But I will say, I guess um, in general, I'm a, a very sensitive person. So it took me a very long time to be able to get back in, into the studio and want to be productive. I think it took mm. maybe about a little over three weeks for me to to feel like, okay, like I can I can make something creative out of the things that I'm feeling. But it took a long time for that to just settle enough for me to to be able to get back back to work. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've talked to other artists who also have felt not th so much the physical part where they were the inability to go into the studio, but psychologically, uh, the news of so many people being lost, the impact it has had on people that they know, and then their own families. So you know, it it'll be interesting, at least for me, to see what work comes out of this, this whole experience. Absolutely. Uh, and, and how that presents itself, how it's manifesting itself in the work. Yeah. So good, good. Well, I'm glad to know that you and your family have been safe through all of this. Yes. Thank you. Good. So the second question I have for you is, when did you know that you were an artist? At what point in your life did you take on the role of being a creative? <laughs> so my story is kind of, I feel like I came to art kind of late. Uh, mm -hmm. As far as the stories that I typically hear from artists where they realized kind of early on in life, like that wasn't my case at all. Mm -hmm. um, my story really kind of started, I think, um, I think that I was as creative as every child is, you know, like every kid likes art, like they like to paint, they like to draw. Yes. And I felt very similar to most kids. Uh, so in, in high school, when I just took a mandatory art class, my, my teacher, uh, I guess noticed something a little bit more in me, right? So he mm -hmm. just kind of, he brought up the idea about me going to art school and I didn't know that art school was a thing. Mm -hmm. At that point I had already decided that I was gonna go into psychology. So uh, what ended up happening is I, I, I did a semester of psychology at UIC here in Chicago. And the true story is that uh, maybe about maybe about a month into like Psych 101, I was in the middle of a lecture hall, mm -hmm. and out of really nowhere, this feeling in the pit of my stomach just kind of bubbled up as a no. Oh, wow. It was just such a, a resounding no. Yes. But, and it just, I think like, it was like the traditional, like the Charlie Brown scenario where everything else then just sounded like womp, womp, womp. Right? <laughs> yes. And I'm like, what am I going to do with this no? And I think that I went home, you know, I think I might have finished the school day. I don't remember anything else. I went home and I waited till like uh, my parents had gone to bed and I remember like going into my parents' bedroom and I woke up my mom. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't know how to tell you this. I can't go back to school tomorrow. Wow. Just like that. And then uh, she's like, are you okay? Are you sick? And I'm like, I'm, I'm fine. I just can't go back to school tomorrow. She's like, we'll talk about it in the morning. So morning came and I just told her about my, my no story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
thankfully my mom is a very she's a very intuitive woman herself she believes mm. in like arise in your body and messages yeah so like it's okay she's like we'll figure it out don't worry like that was her immediate response so uh, there I was at a college dropout out of nowhere <laughs> I've been like a very good student all of my life and yes. also no direction so it took a good five months of very dark depression uh, mm. until I think one day um, like a sketchbook ended up in in my hand and like the only thing that made me feel good was like the act of a, of a pencil to paper wow and that was like a little breakthrough yes I, you know I just thought this is the first time I've felt good in in five months and this must be a clue mm. so at that point the only art school that i had ever heard of was the art school that my art teacher in high school had mentioned to me so i ended up just kind of taking a trip to the american academy of art and um i remember ultimately we end up in the oil painting room at the very end and even though I'd never even seen an oil painting before in real life ever, yes. uh, I remember walking into the room and it just felt so good. All of the smells, like the sights, everything just felt, it just, it just felt right. Yes. And I made my decision based on, on, on that smell, truly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's how I'm like, I'm going to have to make this work because this is where I go. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, it's, it's important, you know, to follow that inner knowing, that inner voice and believe and trust it. You know, often the stress in our lives come from that resistance rather than giving over and giving in to what our mind, body, spirit is telling us is right for us. And I think that reflects itself in your work. So you mentioned your mom's influence and in being a very intuitive person. Tell her how, tell us rather, how she introduced you to Mexican folk medicine. So um, I think um, it took me a long time to even realize that what she, what she was always embodying, what she was always doing, it took me a very long time to realize that, 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 oh, we're talking about folk medicine here, where I think that she was just kind of, she was just kind of living her life, you know, like it, it wasn't ever a, a lesson about like, you know, these are, these are folk Mexican medicinal techniques. Yes. It was just like, she was just a very intuitive, sensitive person. And I think that growing up um, just with a very tight connection with my mom uh you pick up on things like i it, it was just a, a the act of of being a a deep listener mm -hmm. of of a you know <clears throat> witness my mom's testimony of being a, a a mexican woman who had been through a lot she mm -hmm. just been through a lot in in childhood and well, really throughout her life. And so just being kind of um, a witness to those stories kind of forces you to to adopt a different type of lens mm -hmm. to look at the world mm -hmm. with a little more depth, you know? Like, so that I'll, I'll just say that. And, and I think that I'm... Do we want to get into the idea of this ahogamiento now? Absolutely, okay. yes. That's what we're leading towards. Okay, good. So... Uh, this idea of desahogamiento. So the word in, in Spanish is, is or translated rather, is undrowning. And um, there's a very casual way, at least in, in my family and probably directed mostly from my mom, where whenever she sees someone like wanting to tell their story, right? Like that there's something on the tip of their tongue that they want to say, she'll prompt them and she'll say like, desahogate, undrown yourself. Mm. I mean, you know, she's like, do you need to hear music right now? Do you want to just talk it out? Like, do you want to, do you want to laugh it out? Like, you just need to get that out. And I think that um, she's really led her, her life that way because, you know, she didn't have access to talk therapy or, 
you know, really anyone, frankly, throughout her life, even asking her if she was okay. So as a means to, to self-soothe, mm -hmm. what she had access to was undrowning herself mm -hmm. through, through mourning, through grief, mostly. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what I have come to, to realize is that um, growing up with that sensibility of how to, how to self-soothe, how to self-heal, that for me, painting took over that, that instinct. Um, through painting, I, I can access like the... Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know about you, but no one ever is, this is going, my friends are going to be very mad at me about this, but typically friends don't, they might not know the questions to ask you about mm -hmm. the things that you're going through. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important to have like that self-directed healing mm -hmm. that you can just, you know, like I'm here alone in my studio and I can paint out the things that I need to get out. Yes, and, and um, you mentioned during uh, the, there's a recording that we're going to be releasing or many people while watching this may have already listened to it. And you said that the undrowning, that grieving process, sometimes it's a transference of the weight we carry. And it can manifest itself in the process of talking to someone, uh, crying, screaming, and singing, it's that self-soothing, it's the release of all the angst and anxieties that embody us and really can be detrimental if we don't find an outlet for that. And so for you, the outlet is your painting. And But I wanted to know if you've ever witnessed that, someone going through that process, and if that, in, in witnessing that, if that inspired a, a work that you created. Hmm. Hmm. I, I mean, uh, I'm going to be redundant, but I, I, I think that I feel so strongly about the process of this ahogamiento because to mm -hmm. me, uh, my mom continues to be that person that, uh, uh, you know, people wouldn't believe uh, from experiencing what a warm person she is. Mm -hmm. how much trauma she's mm -hmm. been through mm -hmm. and what a healthy person she is just physically emotionally spiritually like the resilience that she embodies and how that was made possible through this ahogamiento like there was no other there was just no other avenue for her healing mm. and so i think that was just such a um you know it was just such a powerful example to know that mm -hmm. that that we um, that we have access to that kind of healing, that kind of self healing, mm -hmm. and that's yeah, that's where I draw from. Uh, I love that. Um, you also draw from what you described as an intuitive ways of knowing, and in particular, uh, dream work and storytelling. So tell us about the dream work and and the storytelling. Tell us about that. <laughs> so, uh, I guess when I say dream work, there are, so first of all, I think that everyone dreams and we might not remember our dreams. And, yes. and furthermore, um, I even, there are writings about this, but a lot of people believe that, um, or I should say, uh, Jungian depth psychologists mm -hmm. believe that some dreams, some archetypes in the dreams remain at the unconscious level. So not everything is meant to be remembered, to be thought about, written out. A lot of these things are meant to be on the subconscious level, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And so I guess when I say like dream work that is important to me, I have um, a series that I've done on tornadoes. Uh, that started in 2009, I want to say. And um, so I first started doing them because I was dreaming about tornadoes a lot. And I just figured, oh, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll paint it out. And mm -hmm. then it'll be done and over with. So it kind of worked. Um, and 
maybe about two years ago, um, it, well, I'll, I'll say the tornado dream symbol kind of left me for maybe seven years or so. And then they just kind of surged out of nowhere and I started dreaming about tornadoes again. And I'm like, okay, well, I, I, I like to listen to uh, those repetitive dream symbols. And um, painting tornadoes again, it made me feel like, um, uh, again, with so much time that had passed and things that I had now read about, um, I'm interested in like the possibility that 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 our dream lives are connected to impressions that we get from the environment itself. Mm, mm-hmm. um, so that's where the idea of of somatic ecology comes up. Um, uh, and and again, this is all. Uh, these are kind of new terms. Like I want to say, somatic ecology and and eco psychology are like nineteen nineties terms and two thousands. Yes. So well, before, can you explain what somatic um, healing technology is? <laughs> so uh, somatic, very simply, somatic means of the body. Yes. So again, even grief work can be a somatic healing technology. Like mm-hmm. you literally crying things out is a somatic healing technology. Um, so yeah, um, I didn't. Have, did that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. I just didn't want us to um, state that without defining it because it may be a new term for many people. Yeah. And and so I wanted to know. Um, well, wanted first for you to talk about that as it relates to your work, uh, so to define it and then help us understand how you apply it in your art making. Sure. So again, uh, uh, to me, even a a somatic healing technique for me is painting. Mm -hmm. That I know that I feel a release of some sort. I know that something has moved through me by exhausting that feeling onto Mm -hmm. a canvas, onto Mm -hmm. a panel. So that to me is how I, I define like my own personal somatic healing technology. And then you also draw from uh, eco psychology mm-hmm. and tell us how that relates to you as an artist and how it manifests itself in your work. Okay. So again, eco psychology is a fancy way of saying that we feel better connected to the earth. Mm-hmm. Our psychology is affected by our relationship nature um and i guess what i want to say about that and i know i'm going to come back around to your question but the thing that it's taken me a long time to to realize is that um through my painting of landscapes and particularly um beautiful landscapes um i feel like i've what i'm trying to do is reclaim my my belonging to the earth. Mm. Um, and that sounds so simple. It, it can sound so, um, it just can sound so, so obvious, so trite. But to me, it, it is the most complicated position to arrive at when, when you grow up on the south side of Chicago and there's no green spaces mm-hmm. and and you don't feel that inherent connection to land because you're not from there, right? Like mm-hmm. your, your parents don't have a connection to that particular section of the earth. And, and so that, um, that longing for, for a connection to earth gets, mm, it, 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 hmm. I think it affects our it, it affects our health. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's the disconnect, the living with and being surrounded by so many things that are manufactured yeah. um, that removes us from the earth, the smell of the soil, the rain, um, that I, I truly believe and was absolutely fascinated by the eco-psychology um, and the fact that it... Um, isn't part of the impulse for your creative process. Mm-hmm. So it resonated with me very strongly. I think also because I've had the wonderful 
privilege and opportunity to visit Africa and um, like seven countries mm -hmm. and to live out in the bush uh, in the desert with the Tuareg people and there's for me it was magical for them they were living in some cases with great hardship as I viewed it because you know my existence here is very different but for me living in the desert surrounded by all that nature offered it was it makes me think about the importance of water and not being wasteful of it the yeah. smell of the desert living through the sandstorms all of that was so magical and also a reminder that we are from the earth that's where we go back to <laughs> when we leave this place and and how important it is to stay connected and yeah. so i'm very grateful for having those experiences so when you when i was reading about this being a philosophy and a practice that drives your process i just became very fascinated by it um, and i think that the painting behind me controlled burn is a really good example of that can you talk to us about that piece sure so I'll ask you as a side note, should we yes. start with, because um, remember when you were in the studio and I told you that uh, the impulse to, to start this controlled burn series was really personal. Like it started yeah. in childhood before I understood that the earth was in peril. Yes, so. absolutely. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Start there. Because <laughs> it's kind of a, of a long winding story again. Um, That's okay. 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 <laughs> so, the uh, I'll, I'll begin by saying that um, you know I, I haven't always been aware of course of, of, of the state of the planet mm -hmm. and um, when when I first became interested in the idea of, of controlled burns um, I was a child um, I was I, I believe eight years old eight or nine years old and it was um, it was after taking a field trip to a forest preserve mm. where I saw the after effects of, of a burn. And by that time, again, just being a sensitive kid, um, I think I was already dealing with like feelings of, of, of impotence, like in, in my environment, in, in my home life. And so uh, when I was introduced to the idea that a fire could be a a cleansing a cleansing force in you know in a plot of land that could yes. regenerate that could make something healthier um that to me was just such a comforting it was just such a comforting poetic way of thinking about you know the elements of fire and so i think i i just kind of held that idea close to heart and uh I, I believe that about 10 years later is when I made my first controlled burn painting. Mm -hmm. So I was maybe, you know, 20 years old or so. And, um, and again, still at that time, I had no concept uh, about, you know, the, the state of the planet. Mm -hmm. So I was really just, um, I was really just working off of that childhood impulse of painting um, fire as a restorative element. And, and it, w it really wasn't until the Australia burns, mm. where, um, I think I, I forwarded you that, that YouTube clip yes. of, a, of a, an indigenous fire practitioner that, uh, where he says these fires could have been preventable. Um, by the act, of employing controlled burns hmm. on the land, we could have prevented all of this from happening. Like we, sorry, I'm gonna pause there. Okay. Um, how do I say that succinctly? Um, hmm. By getting away from indigenous knowledge, mm. I think that we are 
that we're smarter than the land, that we, yeah. we control the land instead of, um, instead of listening, mm-hmm. understanding what the mm-hmm. land needs. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, if people who live close to the land yes. understand those things. They have never abandoned that knowledge. Absolutely. And so the idea of, um, of, again, reclaiming or allowing indigenous wisdom to come to come to the forefront and tell us how to steward the earth. That to me is is now what this controlled burn series is, has always been meant to be about. But so let's talk about control burn then the piece that you created or did you want to I mean you kind of con, uh, contextualize it within that narrative but did you want to say something more about it? Um, you mentioned before that you wanted me to talk about technique. Is this the right time? Or should yeah, we... absolutely. Okay. What should I say about technique? Sometimes you don't know like what's interesting to a person. Cause you're just like, I've just been doing this forever. <laughs> um, I guess what I'll say about, about technique is um i actually just uh posted for the first time ever i won't say that i'm a secretive person when it comes mm-hmm. to my process i'm just very quiet yeah it just kind of occurred to me you know uh because of 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 our current state of affairs that it might be enjoyable for people to see uh mm-hmm. my process from beginning to end nice. so i put that on on instagram so for those interested, you'd be able to see how a, a panel begins. Um, but I'll just say that my, my process is, um, I think it's fairly traditional. I mean, there's, uh, from beginning to end, it's really just oil paint. I know that a lot of people, uh, you know, will paint. Uh, in fact, people often think because my work can be photographic or almost mm-hmm. photographic, mm-hmm. I think that I'm painting on top of, of a photo. Mm. So that's not the case. Um, and I, I, I don't know if, if you'd be able to appreciate it on, you know, most photos, but uh, texture is actually very important to me. Um, and not for the sake of texture. I like the, the, the intimacy of being able to get up very close to something and see the the attention to to detail and the the care the intimacy that went into an, an image um and i think even the idea of intimacy is something that um that goes into my painting philosophy as well mm-hmm. um, uh, and and i again will bring that back to um you know ideas of somatic ecology and, and eco psychology like through being more intimate through sorry through being more intimate with the land with our our actions our interactions with the land Mm -hmm. i mean that's um that's how we we rebuild those connections great um tell us about mono y tierra and the hand that appears in that piece who Whose hand is that? <laughs> so, uh, you might imagine. Uh, so, uh, um, it literally translates to hand and earth. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, again, <clears throat> I mean, so I, earlier in this conversation, you asked me about storytelling. Yes. Maybe this is a good moment to bring up storytelling. Um, Again, I've mentioned that I'm, I've, I've just been extremely informed by, um, by hearing my mom, you know, tell all these uh, stories from her childhood. So there's one particularly fascinating story that I, that I keep close to heart and that I think has informed um, my way of thinking about, um, about the earth and its connection to, to magic. Um, and that is a thing that I'm interested in, in capturing um, these, uh, really, every image. Like, I really hope that there's an element of, of mystery and magic in my work. And that comes from, from hearing these kind of fantastical stories from my mom. 
So I'm going to go ahead and share one if that's okay. Please do. Yes. <laughs> and this might be edited out, but I'll just share it. So <clears throat> my mom tells a story about um, she was seven. She was six or seven years old. Um, and she was put to work uh, tilling field uh, mm-hmm. in order for, for corn to be planted. So um, her family was so poor that, that she didn't have any shoes. So imagine this is a, a seven or a six or seven year old out tilling dry earth, no shoes on. And so she talks about how, you know, you, you dig just a, a little bit into the earth and it unearths scorpions, it unearths small snakes, mice. Mm-hmm. And so they'd crawl all over her legs. And uh, obviously that's a very terrifying experience for a child. Um, so in, in Mexican folk medicine, we believe that there is um, an ailment called susto, which literally means fright. That just by being scared, by like a, a severe scare, that it can actually cause a physical ailment. So this is what ends up happening to to my mom. Um, so I don't, I, you know, I don't remember how long she had been working in in these conditions, but eventually she becomes very ill. Um, there was a fever that they couldn't break. She was vomiting, uh, and you know, being from a very small town and being poor, that's almost a death sentence. You know, you can't stop a child's fever and their, you know, their physical state is, is worsening. And so what ends up happening is that, um, you know, a, a, a neighbor uh, hears about my mom's condition and says to my grandmother, what this child needs is to be scared again. It's like, you need to take her to a red anthill mm. and place her on top of the hill. And so this is what happens. Uh, they, so they, they find a, a red anthill, take my, my mom, and they place her on top of this hill. So she's like, you know, she's like obviously terrified that they're going to bite her. What ends up happening is that she sees these ants crawl up her tiny little legs. They reach her knee and they fall over, curl and die. Oh my gosh. One bit her. So the idea is that the ants absorbed her fright. Mm. They died and she was cured. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> So I have a couple of stories like that, that, uh, you know, like, um, you know, walking through your life, carrying these kinds of magical realist stories about mm-hmm. how humans have and can interact with nature, where there's, um, you know, understanding that we are not more powerful, that there's communication happening there. Um, it it affects the way that you move through the through the world, and I, I think that I I keep that um that sensibility in in my work. Hopefully, yes, you absolutely do. So your mother's hand is shown tilling the soil and pulling a particular. Is that a flower or an herb that appears in the painting? So uh, that that painting is really just about my mom gardening in her backyard. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that's like a very, um, that's a, a way for me to, um, to show her engaging with the land out of pleasure. Mm-hmm. Right? Like it's, it's kind of reclaiming that, that connection to earth, not being about uh, the working conditions that she knew as a child or that she were, you know, that she knew here in the States where the conditions of labor you would imagine would make someone not want to have a connection with um, with planting anything ever again, mm. and and yet you know she she loves her garden and it's restorative, and I just wanted to kind of pay homage to that. Yes, absolutely. Um, and lastly, there's uh, 
a painting called Primordial Conversations. And um, it sh in it appears a mother combing, I am assuming, her daughter's hair. But there's something that's interesting that's going on to the right of that painting and there's a plant that appears to be like being blown or it's kind of tilted the leaves are leaning a bit so can you dissect that for us a little bit and tell us what's going on in there interpret it for us so uh, to me uh to me primordial conversations is about uh the conversations that happen without speaking right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the language of touch first of all like you touching someone uh, transmits, it transmits energy, it transmits uh, intention. Um, so just the act of like, uh, of someone, you know, touching your head, which is so, it's so precious, it's so uh, tender. So I wanted, I, I just love that act. Um, so that is one form of a primordial conversation. And then, there's the child who is looking at this plant on the table in front of her. And uh, the whole scene to me is, is very quiet. It's almost eerily quiet. And, um, and yet there is, um, there is unspoken conversation. Like those moments of quiet are when we can contemplate like the, uh, uh, again, like the idea of, of looking at a, at a plant and, um, again, there's this, in, there's this belief um, that indigenous people keep close to heart that plants are talking to us. Mm -hmm. um, being in the presence of plants, we, we, we pick up messages without even knowing. And I guess I wanted to, to, uh, to address that idea and to magnify the magic of that uh, of that kind of interaction and so um yeah no i think that's that's all i want to say on that <laughs> oh good yeah. that's great well elsa it's been a pleasure uh speaking with you today really fascinating interpretations of your work and it's the influence of mexican folk medicines and your stories uh and how they influence what magnificent paintings you create. So thank you for joining me for Tea Time. And um, as I've shared with everyone, at some point when the world opens up, we are going to be celebrating um, this exhibition that is really amazing and fantastic. So we can't wait to invite you know, the artist in and the public in to share in this magical experience. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you so much. And, I, and just to, to end on, on this note, um, it's not lost on me that you know, this show is about healing. Yes. And whenever, you know, when, whenever we are finally able to reconvene and have this show, it'll be right on time. Absolutely, it will. I believe in the universe. <laughs> so thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you.